There's so much I want to talk to you about today. I want to share with you a vision for food production that helps us store carbon in the soil. And I want to share with you a novel approach for how we might do that. Importantly, I want to talk a little bit about the inspiration for how I got here. I've been in a uh, faculty member in the environmental studies program here at the University of Washington for over 10 years. When I first started teaching, one of the first classes I taught was our introductory course, Environment 100, Introduction to Environmental Studies. This dynamic course covers all the important topics of life in the 21st century. We talk about climate change, ocean acidification, biodiversity loss, complex social ecological systems, and the incredible rise of human population on our planet. When I first started teaching, no one told me what an important partner a box of Kleenex might be. I love teaching. One of the things I love about teaching is the work of grappling with the topics that I'm about to teach about and making those topics most relevant to my students. As I grappled with the topics of this great course, I found myself coming to terms with my own grief and despair. I was not prepared for the emotional consequences of what I was teaching about. And I was wildly unprepared for the grief that my students would be bringing to me. How my students would come into my office with tears in their eyes as they grappled with the impending consequences of our capricious use of fossil fuels. We've been burning carbon at an alarming rate. My students would come to me and they would say, Eli, it's like a vicious cycle. It's like an addiction. We all know oil is the, is the glue of the global economy, and yet we continue to burn oil. We know oil is the problem. And we've been burning oil at this alarming rate, putting it into our atmosphere. Environment 100 brings us an opportunity to summarize the state of the world in the 21st century. It brings me into a space of a disorienting dilemma. It shakes my students to the foundation of their understanding, and it brings me to the precipice of my capacity as an educator. I found myself grappling with the question, what can be done? My students came to me and asked, Eli, what can be done? Worse, my students came to me and asked, Eli, what are you doing? I've decided to invest my time and energy in food production systems that help us store carbon in the soil. I'm excited about these systems. And today, I want to talk to you about a vision for agriculture that includes grass, kelp, pasture management, and helps store carbon in the soil. Before we can get there, I'd like to invite you all to take a deep breath. Every time we breathe, we're interacting with the planet's global carbon cycle. We breathe in rich, nourishing oxygen deep into the center of our lungs, and we breathe out carbon dioxide. This ancient process of respiration is not the problem. Respiration is balanced by photosynthesis. Plants are bringing carbon dioxide from their environment into their own tissues. So respiration is balanced by photosynthesis. And that's our planet's carbon cycle. This system is simple, elegant, and effective. And I can use this system on my farm to help grow vegetables. I can grow vegetables in a way that helps us bring carbon back into the soil. In the soil, carbon can fuel productivity and foster planetary biodiversity. I'm farming in a way that helps the earth breathe, that helps bring carbon back home. 
It's a very simple cycle. There it is. Carbon can, can be in a solid form. It can move into the air in a gaseous form. And plants can help us bring it back again. As a practicing regenerative organic farmer, I'm farming in a way that helps store carbon in the soil. I've reduced all of the tillage that we do on our farm. So we're disturbing the soil as little as possible, maximizing the possibility of storing carbon in the soil, helping the earth breathe a little better. And while I've been at work at this job, I notice it seems like the earth has been hyperventilating. During my lifetime, we've burned through more than half of the world's fossil fuel reserves. And that's a lot of carbon. That carbon, the combustion of those fossil fuels, has allowed carbon to go into the atmosphere. In the atmosphere, that carbon is causing global climate change, disrupting weather patterns. Luckily for us, all the carbon that we've emitted hasn't ended up in the atmosphere. If it had, we'd be in a much worse situation. A lot of the carbon that we've emitted has dissolved into the world's oceans. And in the world's oceans, the carbon is also causing problems. For ocean communities, excess carbon dioxide is driving a more acidic ocean, making conditions less hospitable for most marine life and causing a cascade of marine biodiversity loss. Importantly, marine aquatic plants and macroalgae like kelp can do the work of pulling carbon out of solution in the water and bringing it in to their own bodies, building their own biomass. A plant like kelp can grow as much as 10 inches in a day. That's a lot of carbon pulled out of the water. And that's terrific. But, you know, to my life as a dirt farmer, kelp really never seemed that important. Although when I think about it, kelp can be a very important food resource for humans. And in the deep history of our evolution, especially for native communities here on the Pacific North Coast, kelp was very, very important. This is a picture of the only kelp farm in Washington State, which is located right here in the Hood Canal. And in this kelp farm, they're growing enormous quantities of kelp for human food. And that's inspiring. They're pulling carbon out of the ocean and feeding people. It's not that dissimilar to what I'm doing, but it's always seemed to me that kelp production and regenerative pasture management are oceans apart. That all changed for me one day when I happened to overhear a conversation outside my office door from a Washington State Sea Grant officer and an aspiring kelp farmer who had just successfully grown his first crop of kelp and was looking for a place for some of the excess kelp to grow. And that really got me thinking. I thought, what if we could take some of that kelp that had pulled carbon from the ocean and deposit it on our soils, helping grass grow better, helping grass pull carbon out of the air? We could effectively double down on our carbon capture on this simple, elegant solution to help offset the problem of climate change. So we got our hands on some of that kelp and started to think into this question. Could we increase the possibility of carbon storage on pasture land using kelp? So with support from the University of Washington student farm and some engaging student farmers and the Washington State Sea Grant program, we were able to set up some experimental plots at the University of Washington farm. And we started to look into what happens to grass when you put kelp on it. It turns out our research was really exciting and fun. There's big changes that happen to grass when you put kelp on it. The grass initially on the plots that received kelp was 
darker green, it was thicker and more lush. If I was a cow, it's the grass I would want to eat. <laughs> we measured biomass and we saw that on the plots that received kelp, there was more grass. It weighed more and there was more of it. <laughs> With a tiny hypodermic needle in the cold winter, we poked the grass and then measured how far it grew. How long was the distance between the two scars? And we found out that the grass on the plots that received kelp grew better. Grass can pull carbon out of the atmosphere. And kelp can help grass do that better. But how is this all related to food production? Well, it's pretty amazing. Grass invests an enormous amount of energy in its roots, and especially perennial grasses, grasses on pasture that don't get tilled up year after year, but grow year after year in lush green amounts. Gr perennial grasses store an enormous amount of their resource underground in their roots. And here you can see a researcher from the Land Institute in Kansas holding up an individual perennial grass. And you can see how much investment that plant has made in storing carbon underground. It's no accident that this research station is in Kansas because Kansas is also some of our most productive soils. The prairies of the Midwest evolved in these grassland systems. They evolved with grazers. I love grazers. As a farmer, I love grazers. And as you think about grazers, you're probably thinking about cows. But on my farm, we raise goats. These are some of this year's babies. Grass evolved to be eaten by grazers. We have mid the Midwest of the United States, the American breadbasket, the richest agricultural soils we have in our nation are rich with carbon because of grazers, because the American buffalo and the long evolutionary history of those systems and the investment year after year that the grass made in the carbon storage underground. That's why those soils are so productive. That's why grazers and grass belong together. And it turns out there aren't more ruminants, more sheep, goats, cows here in America now than there were in 1800. There are less buffalo. So cows aren't driving climate change, but we can raise cows on pasture in ways that help us combat the deleterious effects of climate change. I am really excited about the idea of improving Pacific Northwest pasture with nutrients and carbon from marine systems, helping increase the capacity of our pastures to store more carbon in our soils. I think this is an exciting vision for agriculture. This simple, this simple cycle, carbon moves in solid forms to gaseous forms and plants can bring it back again. This is the cycle of the earth breathing. And I'm inspired to do this work. It isn't carbon stored underground that's a problem. It's displaced carbon from the burning of fossil fuels. But our planet has amazing natural capacities to cycle carbon. Herbivores, humans, our food system, these are all touch points in this complex cycle of carbon. And each one of these has its own opportunity for us to explore solutions for how to manage the carbon problem. I have found one, kelp, pasture, grazing ruminants, that meets me in the center of my passion for food production. But there are as many solutions out there as there are people to think into them. So now when I meet students in my office, with a tissue in hand, I take a deep breath. I urge them to connect 
with the center of their own hearts, to think into their own gifts, and to think about ways that they might share those gifts through actions, large and small, with the world. Because action gives rise to hope. And we can't change the world without that. Thank you.